Hello. Welcome to EFC Plus, the college funding solution. My name is Fred Amrine, and today's topic is student loans and student loan repayment. Just a quick disclaimer, Amrine Financial is is an independent fee-only financial planning firm. Any financial products discussed today are are not recommendations to purchase. You should consult with a financial professional or tax expert before making any investment decisions. Past performance is no guarantee of future performances. Tonight's agenda is going to go over the student loan repayment. We're going to do a quick review of the financial aid process and how the award letter process works. We're going to look at how important the debt structure is. That, for me, is becoming more and more important as we go through this. It will dictate your repayment and loan forgiveness options um, at graduation. We also want to discuss what life looks like at graduation, how important the debt structure is. We're seeing more and more families um, need to envision their child's life at age 25 because there's more education required to get to the careers they're, uh, they're looking for. And we're going to go through a quick uh, overview or conclusion as we go through this. Current environment is, is not very pretty when you really look at it. Um, current student debt exceeds 1.2. It's approaching $1.3 trillion. It's larger than car or credit card debt in this country. It's second to mortgage debt. Um, we're also seeing an increasing dissatisfaction with the college education on, on what we would say return on investment because we're spending a lot of money and the careers that are being created or pursued are not really paying back based on the investment in the education. Um, I, we as parents need to be smarter and coach our children better in my eyes. It impacts, it's starting to impact the other aspects of our children's lives. That would include when they get married, ability to buy a house, other financial goals that they may have are getting postponed because of the amount of debt that these uh, young adults are carrying into to their, their early professional lives. Also, I think there's a, an issue with um, the headlines versus reality. Um, we look at a, a study each year by Accenture um, that really looks at the what students are expecting to get and what students re- really get. And it's a wake-up call. So I think a lot of times when you go through the college process, you have to envision the outcome, and and too much time is spent on just the the front end of the process. So I just want to do a quick review of how the financial aid process works. We're not going to go over the EFC calculation. In this case, we're going to say it is a federal methodology schools, or that's what we're looking at. If you notice, the EFC is $25,000. We're assuming this family has completed their FAFSA form. And if you notice, it will be the same at both numbers because of the federal methodology. But in the first school, either it's a $20,000 school, they have an EFC of $25,000. They're not going to qualify for any need-based aid, but because they filled out the FAFSA form, the student will get, this is a freshman year, $5,500 of a direct Stafford loan. So we recommend every family complete the FAFSA form for a variety of reasons, especially with debt structuring, as we talked about that, and we'll talk about that in a few more minutes. But in the second case, we will qualify for aid. So it's cost of attendance minus our EFC is what we qualify for need-based aid. So we have a $40,000 school less the 25. We have need of 15. And if you notice, most schools will not meet 100% of need. So we have a $12,000 award package. We're going to see how that's broken up in a minute here. But the school doesn't meet 100% of need. And within that $12,000, it won't be all free. So there will be loans and work study included in that number. Here's a breakup of what the award letter looks like. So once you get admitted into a school, again, with the prior prior change, these award letters will come out at different times. Has that would usually come out in the late March, April 1st time frame. As you can see here, that the award letters for school one, because we didn't qualify for need-based aid, we received a unsubsidized Stafford loan. In the second case, we did qualify for need-based aid, and here's how the 12000 was broken up. We have a $3,500 subsidized loan, which means the interest we paid on that loan while the student stays in school. The unsubsidized loan is $2,000, which means interest will be charged to that loan once the disbursement occurs. Then we have work study, and then we also have a grant of $5,000. So again, the school didn't meet 100% of need, and only 5000 of the fifteen in this case was free money as we go through the process. So also as you go through this, why are students going going to college? I think a lot of them are looking for a career or a job. That's the outcome. But in, in many cases, we have to be smarter. Just because you have a degree doesn't guarantee you the job that either you've gone to f- school for or the career that you want to pursue. So, again, we have to be a little bit smarter. 
Also, in a lot of cases, it's more of a stepping stone. As I said, more and more careers are requiring postgraduate study, so this is a stepping stone to grad school, medical school, law school, physical therapy, speech pathology, um, all those type of careers require postgraduate studies, so it's a stepping stone. Also, I think there's a lot of peer pressure in this process for education. Um, everyone wants to go to college. Um, I think with when you look at the graduation rates, uh, we're either not mature enough or we're trying to find ourselves. So sometimes it may be better off to take a year off and, and understand what we're trying to do because it is a lot of money. And, and if they're not sure, that's okay. I mean, it's an important part um, that you visit the career centers, see what opportunities the schools have to offer in that area, work with maybe a career counselor, and try to figure out what you're going to try to do and, and what the investment is going to be. As you can see, as you go through this process, we really think you have to understand your cash flows because that's going to dictate your, your student loans and when you should take them and, and how much you're going to need. So each year you'll complete the FAFSA form. Um, that will determine um, how much you qualify for need-based aid. It's, it's an important part that you do it for four years, and, and our tool, EFC Plus, does that. You're going to see the advantages of doing it over four years. It helps you with maybe if you have multiple children, they're going to overlap. You may qualify for more aid, giving, giving you more opportunities or make a school more affordable for you. Financial aid is now the highest reason for transfer. So, again, this gets into the emotional part of the, of the first-year decision. The transfer could happen for a variety of reasons. Maybe there was a scholarship that required a certain GPA, and the student didn't have enough academic strength to, to maintain the scholarship, so that scholarship is taken away. But also, we, you know, we get emotionally tied to a school, and, and we think we're going to make it and realize that it, it becomes very, very expensive. And also, by doing the cash flow, it, it structures the debt, but also you'll show you, you'll see how the debt structure and who's going to be responsible for that and what the loan repayment impact will be as you go through this. This is just a picture of, of how or, or why we do the four years and why it's so important. In this case, this family has a second child. Um, so taking the first year award letter and multiplying by four in, I, in our eyes isn't good enough um, because there's too many factors that can move around. If you have a need-based merit award, if the school could front load the award, here we have a second child that's going to come on board, so the school's going to be kind and, and give them more money in those outer years. It can happen invertly if maybe you have a second child. The first one or two years could look affordable, and then that oldest child graduates, and because of the, the award letter structure, it may not become affordable. So, again, this results in a transfer, which means loss of credit, which may also delay graduation. So by doing a four-year and having the details and how or what you're going to be paying over the four years becomes very, very important in our decision-making process and what you should be doing. In this case here, you can see how this converts. So the first part we just saw was what we're going to pay over the four years, but each person needs to look at how they're going to pay. So in this case, this family has $25,000 saved. They can afford $10,000 per year, and each of the red columns or, or areas require is the additional amount of uh, debt that's going to require or resources to, to graduate from this school. So again, you can see how... The, the outer years could look affordable because of what that will look like uh, with the second child and what we're going to pay over the four years. Also, the debt structure is kind of important um, because the debt structure will dictate who's legally responsible to pay for it, what repayment options you will have, and what loan forgiveness options. So the students have a lot more options on the loan repayment and loan forgiveness uh, areas where the parents are somewhat limited in what they can do on top of the student loan uh, ratios or interest rates are much lower and fees on the parent side they're typically a lot higher so again on the on the first side we look at the Stafford limits the direct loan limits there's the 5500 6500 7500 and 7500 this is for a dependent student and then here's where the cash flow that we just showed you the student is going to need another seventy six thousand dollars to go to the school over the four years based on the cash flow so if the parent should borrow the money uh, the parent plus loan is uh, 6.31 plus the fees. They'll have about a $866, assuming a 10 pay, monthly fee of graduation, where if they do a home equity, the, it could be a little bit lower. And if they do a private or, or student loan, private student loan, it could be a, a little more affordable also. But again, each of these are unique to the student, what, what is qualifying for you. The advantage is to the federal programs, there is a death and disability clause uh, that, that could help you if that should happen, God forbid. But again, understanding how your debt is going to structured and, and what your repayment options will be is critical in the process. So as you go through this, we're looking at how we can finance this. Uh, 
again, by doing the cash flow, sometimes we're, we're going to, in most cases, you would try to defer the debt as long as possible. College is a little bit different because of, of as I said, who's responsible, who has what advantages. So, you know, the student can qualify for loan forgiveness, have better loan repayment. In most cases, it's best to take on the student loan debt at the very beginning. This will help the parents cash flow. If they run out of money or the or the debt structure, they still need more money, it will reduce the amount of debt that will be in the parent's name. So um, always take the, the federal student loans first. The first type of loan also is, is another type for lower income families is the Perkins loans. That that will be, or next year, 2017, 2018, will be the last year those type of loans will be available. Perkins loan will go away uh, next year. Again, that's primarily for lower income families. Then you have the direct stack for loans. So we saw how that's a progressive amount. Each year that can go up based on your academic progress. And then subsidized and unsubsidized. Subsidized means the interest rate will be paid while you're in school. This would include postgraduate studies. Unsubsidized means interest is being charged that loan until repayment starts. So again, and it still could go on after repayment depending on your repayment option. Then we have a Parent PLUS loan. So this is, again is a federal program. It has those advantages. This is a loan that's in the parent's name. They're, they're limited on the repayment options. And, and if you have structured your debt this way, the one advantage is here, the federal program, we talked about the death and disability of both the borrow and with the parent plus loan also if the student should pass away or become disabled, they would also be forgiven. So even though it's legally the parents, there's as a link to the student in that case. There are grad plus and grad staffer loans or direct loans. Again, that will depend on your financial conditions. Um, they will also have higher interest rates, but they are part of the federal programs. As you can see, each of the programs, um, there is loan limits per year, and then there's also lifetime limits um, on the federal side. So Again, structuring your debt under the federal programs is usually, I would recommend to look at it first because of the, the different loan repayment options and loan forgiveness options on the back end. After you get past the federal side, you have to look at the alternative private loans. So that would be a loan that's in the student's name and typically you're gonna need a co-signer, which means you are legally tied to that loan. So just because you've co-signed for a loan, it doesn't mean it's in the student's name Typically, it's going to reflect your debt-to-income ratios. It's going to affect your FICA scores. It could affect other financing you have down the road. So, again, you're tied to that loan directly. There's some new alternative loans out there that are kind of copying some of the um, Australia the, uh, options in the sense they're related to your um, income or your potential after graduation. I haven't seen many of those. There's some talk that there's more and more of those being created, but it, that is out there. And also you have the parent personal loan. So they could take maybe a home equity loan or, or just a, a pure bank loan if they have a good FICA score and they can qualify for a lower interest rate. Um, the, the federal parent plus loans are fairly expensive when you add in the fees and you look at the interest rates. Um, in many cases, some of the personal loans could be a little more affordable or, or more cost effective if you look at your cost of money. But again, there are some benefits from the other programs. Home equity, again, could help you on interest deductions if you're uh, you know, upper middle family. Each year, you, you are able to deduct some of that interest, depending on how it's structured. And then the, the last type is to look at uh, retirement accounts. Um, you need to be very careful if you go down that path. If you take a, a loan for your 401k, 403b, um, any type of company retirement account, usually there's a limit. You are paying yourself back, but if now you should get laid off or maybe you want to change jobs, if you have an outstanding loan balance and you do not pay it back within the first 60 days after you leave, it will come in as income. So that would affect your EFC the following year. So you need to be very, very careful if you're on that path. As you go through the financing options, also, there's administrative fees that, that are charged to the, the rates. The federal loans are established um, each May, and they're semi-variable. What I mean by that is there's an annual amount that's given, but it will change each year. So if you're graduating you know, from college, you could, you know, could have, in, in, under the current rules, four different interest rates because you have a new rate for each loan, assuming you graduate in four years. Um, many of the private student loans for undergraduate are variable rates, and there's less and less companies that do that because of the risk. And again, it's it's not maybe some of the cost effective. And as you go out, as you borrow more money, you your debt to income ratio um, will get worse, which will then probably raise your rate. So that's where you have to start comparing the different options, um, which include the fixed rate that the Parent Plus loan may offer. Home home equities you could go either way. So you could get a, a variable home equity loan or a line of credit. It can be both variable and fixed. 
So that, that is an option for you, again, looking at, at those type of things. Um, you need to be careful also with a home equity loan. Um, if you should take it all out, in most cases, on, on the federal side at least, your home equity is not included. But now if I take home equity out and put it in the bank, it becomes a reported asset on the FASTA form. So you need to be very, very careful when you do that. Re- retirement accounts, typically they're normal. They're a fixed rate that you're paying yourself back if you should do the, the retirement accounts. Again, you need to be very careful if you go down that path. And overall, you have to look at your net cost of money and also how important the goal is of what you want to give your child. So what becomes affordable and then what's your total net cost when you add in fees, are you able to deduct the interest, all those type of things have to be factored in your decision making. As we move on to loan repayment and loan forgiveness, as I said earlier, how you structure debt will then feed and flow through this. So the students have much better loan repayment options and loan forgiveness options. There's currently actually, there is nine actually, but there's only eight that are active with new loans. So there's eight different loan, federal loan repayment methods. We're going to go through them in detail in a few more minutes. The private loans, there, there are some limited options. There is some more flexibilities. Some of the lenders are becoming much more accommodating as you go through this process. So um, you need to look at those. Most of that accommodation comes on the back end though. So the, where they see when you've graduated, you have a degree, what's your career path look like? How much money are you making? You're, so you're seeing some more and more activity in that area um, with some of the companies. On the federal side, the loan forgiveness programs, they have to be direct federal loans. So that's an important part. And, and some of the people that maybe had older loans that were fell loans, um, they do not qualify. So that's where the direct loans, um, you need to really look at the inventory of your loans when you go through this. Also, there's a, a difference between the type of loan forgiveness programs. The, the public service, that is a tax-free forgiveness, where most of the other loan forgiveness programs are taxable. So a lot of times when you hear about this, oh, after 20 years or 25 years, my loan forgiveness will kick in. But people don't realize if, if that's a substantial amount, that will be taxable. And, and now you could pay anywhere from you know 15 to 39% in taxes based on that forgiveness, based on your income level at, at time of forgiveness. So be very, very careful on, on the loan forgiveness programs. And it's also somewhat restrictive um, on your, your ability to move around because you have to be employed by a certain type of people. So it's not an easy thing uh, to accomplish. And we're, 2017 will be the first year where we see um, that being rewarded. And as I said earlier, the loan forgiveness it will affect other things, your personal decisions. So where you can work, your career path, you know, who your employer needs to be um, can all have an impact on, on different things. So as I said, there's eight different loan repayment options. If you look at it, um, the one that's not used that often anymore is the income sensitive because that has to do with the with the FEL program, which has kind of gone away. But older loans, you could still see that out there. The standard method is you need to be also careful on the student websites or the, the websites and the loan servicers websites. Standards often confused with uh, the extended standard. So what I when I call it the standard, that means it's a 10 pay, and that's an important number to know because if you are in public uh, loan forgiveness program, that um, you need to use that method or one of the I- IBR methods or IDR methods. So that's an important part to know that number. Then there's a graduate program. The graduate means that um, it's a 10-year program also, but it goes up every two years. I'm not a big fan of those programs because it really gets expensive depending on what your debt is- issues are as you go through for the planning. The extended and the graduate extended, again, I'm not a big fan of the graduated extended, but on the extended side, I do like that option. It really just is a traditional time of, of, of payment. So based on your loan amount, um, that will dictate the number of years you're allowed to pay that back. And then um, it will then be amortized over that period of time. Um, So it's based on your total debt number. Then we start moving into the income determined methods or IDR methods. So you have income-based repayment, which is the the oldest of them, or actually the somewhat of the oldest ones. That will use 15% of your uh, uh, adjusted gross with an adjustment for the poverty level. So your number of dependents, what the current your poverty level is, and then 15% of that number. Pay as you earn is 10%. Again. Income based and pay as you earn are mostly for newer type loans. The repay amount will will use the same type of method, but if you file your taxes, if you are married, it will use a an amount that will take your your spouse's income in, into consideration. 
uh, with IBR and pay as you earn and ICR and ISR. Um, those methods you can file your taxes married and separate and, and get some advantages. So again, it starts getting more and more complicated as you go to, through this path to, to find the best repayment options for you. Probably the most thing as you go through and, and you're trying to decide what method to use, you need to stay current. The penalties for default are severe, and, and you really want to look at this. That is one major advantage of the federal programs here is that there's a lot of different options. If, if now you get laid off or something should happen to your career, um, you can f- move into one of these IBR methods or pay as you earn, depending on the, the age of your, your loans, and you can have a zero payment and still stay current. So there are also from forbearance and, and different programs that are out there that could help you stay current. It's absolutely critical you do that. So just as I said that, staying current is critical. These are some, some of the complexities. Um, colleges and services will typically recommend the lowest. That is not always the best. If we look at some of the IBR methods and pay as you earn, what you have is a thing called negative amortization. That means, say the interest rate on the loan is $200 per month and, and your payment's only $150. That means $50 per month is getting added onto your loans. And that can add up, again, from a cash flow standpoint, that may be attractive for you. But from a long-term financial planning standpoint, all of a sudden your loans started at $50,000 and five years later, they're at fifty-seven, dollars based on, on whatever your payments are. So um, be very careful in your long-term planning when you look at this and, and how that can affect you. Um, other things that will, will impact the, the loan repayment options is how you file your taxes. We talked about earlier filing taxes married and separate, married and joint um, could have an impact on your repayment. Um, other personal financial issues. So now, you know, if I need to buy a car or, or want to you know, get a mortgage or something like that, my debt to income ratios and how my debt structured um, could have an impact on the interest rate or even if I qualify. Career decision. So if you've decided to go down the path for public service, and you're looking for that type of forgiveness, a lot of times you may have to work in a nonprofit environment. And, and what we're seeing um, more and more nonprofit um, situations becoming harder to find. So um, let me give you an example. My daughter's a speech pathologist. Um, a lot of the school districts, traditionally, that would have been a job that they would have hired. More of the townships or, or counties are, are outsourcing that to a third party. Now, in one township, you may qualify, you may be working for the county, um, it would qualify for public loan forgiveness in that job because you're paid by the county. Um, where another county where they've outsourced it to a third party, you're not getting paid by the county, you're getting paid by a, a for-profit or a different type of company, um, if it's a for-profit company. Um, what will happen there is that you're doing exactly the same job, but just because of who's paying you, um, you may not qualify for public service uh, loan forgiveness. So be very, very careful um, if you go down that path and, and who the employer actually will be. And as I said to you, if we shouldn't file our taxes married and separate to qualify for better loan repayment because one spouse has debt, one doesn't, that may result in increased taxes. So you need to, to run the math, work with your CPA as you go through this process. I really do believe in the loan consolidation. Again, you have to be a little bit smarter, especially if you've been in repayment for a little bit longer. Um, so that's an important part. It does simplify the process. It helps you stay organized, puts it on one place. I really think in most cases, if you're just starting out, a loan consolidation is important now. Um, some people that have some Perkins loans, you need to be aware there are some advantages to, to keeping your Perkins loans out. But in most cases, um, it simplifies the process for you. Your Parent PLUS loan, so if you your child has taken on Parent PLUS loans, or you have pay for your child's education, they cannot be consolidated into the students. They are legally the parent's loan, so just be aware of that. Federal loans and private loans cannot be combined on the federal side. So you know, everyone would like to have all their loans on the federal side because of the re- uh, repayment options and forgiveness options. But once you move the, from the federal side and you now consolidate, and there's a lot of companies promoting this private consolidation, sometimes the rates are a lot more attractive. But once you move out of the federal program, there's no coming back. There's no turn back there. So um, be very careful. Be much smarter um, and when you make that decision. Um, as I said earlier, only the direct loans are forgiven for public service loan forgiveness. And again, most cases you're going to work with uh, Fed Loan Servicing if you qualify for that. So working through that process is an important. It may restrict where you can work. And if you do a consolidation, so say you've maybe been a nurse for a few years, and and now you're gonna um, you've gone back for grad school, and and now your debt's large, and, and now what happens is you're using an IBR method to repay, and you consolidate your your federal, your undergrad, and your graduate loans together. Your time clock will start all over again. So be very very careful when you do a consolidation if you're qualifying for public service loan forgiveness.
as you go through the public service loan forgiveness process and, and any other loan repayment options, only certain methods are going to qualify for loan forgiveness. So all the IDR methods will qualify because sometimes you're not going to pay that all off. Again, you need to consider the life changes. So I've gotten married. Maybe I'm using one method. And now because I'm going to file, I may have a difference in, in taxes. Um, that needs to be um, a, a really important part as you look for it. Generally, if again, it, it's no specific job. So you can work for a nonprofit and be an accountant or work for or be a, a computer programmer. It's it's who your employer is. It's not so much what you do. But education in the medical areas probably have the biggest advantages across the board on, on loan forgiveness. There's some unique programs within each of those on top of the federal programs um, that are available. As I said earlier, it could be taxable. So if you're going to use those extended methods of, of 25 and 20 years on, on using the IDR methods, you'll probably still have an outstanding balance, but that amount will be taxable. Now we've talked about the public service forgiveness there. Again, each year you have to requalify for your IDR methods, but I would recommend anytime you change jobs or you um, each year you should submit a form to the, your loan servicer that states that, and get it signed by your employer that states you, you're a full-time employee. You have to be a full-time employee for the public service and, and make 120 on-time payments. They do not need to be sequential. Um, they can, they can, you know, have a gap. Uh, it has to be on time though. So again, each year, and, and that way you can see and keep track of, of, of the paperwork. So anytime you change jobs, I went from one nonprofit to another, I would recommend you when you, before you leave, you get that paperwork signed. And then each year, um, your tax return will not be sufficient information because it doesn't say that you're a full-time employee and a few other things there. So again, having good records is, is really, really important. As I said, on the public service side, you, the, the loan repayment does not have to be sequential. It does have to be on time, though. So here's a quick overview of, of an example. So um, here's a student that graduates, um, has an adjusted gross income of $15,000, another one that's using IBR that has $35,000. So you can see here, um, it, it doesn't matter with, with the what your debt number is. Um, it matters on the ID, IBR method. It matters on what you're making. So here's the difference in, in payment amounts. Here we're making $15,000. We're going to have negative amortization. That means our debt number is going to be going up. So we had $25,000. That number is going to be going up over time. It, it Again, the payments will be variable. And you would qualify for public service loan forgiveness. So if we even though we had a zero payment, those months would add up as, as a possible credit. If I use the... Um, IBR method, and, and I was making 35. It's not as as big, but I, that would still qualify for the public service. And then the standard method, um, and that's why it's important to understand the the 10 year, especially if you're like a, a professional that your income is going to go up, such maybe like a doctor, where you may qualify while you're in residency for a lower payment amount, and then when you get out there and you have an increase in salary, you, you to stay under the public service program, you're going to have to use the standard 10 year pay. So you, it's important that you understand what that number is. In this case here, we had $25,000. It's going to run out to a 20-year amount. So here, again, you have to look at what payment options can be best on their long-term future. Um, as you can see, the differences in numbers here. I think an important part here is having uh, some discussions with your child as they go through the process on, on what life looks like after graduation. So this student made $35,000 at graduation. We take out the taxes. Their net pay is about 26000 and depending on what their loan options and loan forgiveness and, and different things they can do, um, we're seeing more and more students have to come home um, and live 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 home because of, of their debt issues. Uh, more and more 30-year-olds are living back at home than ever before. Um, that's all part of this process. So um, if you can start looking, our, our EFC Plus tool actually has a personal P&L. And, and the sooner you can engage them in this, these financial discussions, I think the better they will be prepared and hopefully make better decisions as they go through that, that process of, of picking college. So as you go through this process, hopefully you've gotten some good information. An important part as you go through structuring the debt, understand whose debt it is legally because that's going to dictate also your, your repayments and a loan forgiveness. And look at your cash flows. College funding and college debt structure is a little bit different than your traditional postponed debt as long as possible because it really changes who's legally responsible and the interest rates you'll be charging or being charged for that. Realize the impact it may have on your personal life, how much money you know, and whose debt will be to get to where I want to go at 25. That's an important part. As, as I'm seeing more and more families, I'm trying to make that better value decision. I think that's the biggest change that many parents are facing 
is is looking at what their life their child looks like at, at age 25 whose debt it's, it is um, we're seeing situations where maybe you've spent uh, the money for them to go to that more um, prestigious college and and now they need grad school and, and you've done a really good job and, and now they're going to be 25 years old with one hundred thirty thousand dollars of debt because they need a grad school um, maybe if we had reallocated that money a better way, they would have had less debt at, at graduation. That's why I think it's important to, to understand the career path as soon as they can get there because that way you can make better financial decisions. And we talked about the headlines versus reality. Um, I, on our website, um, I think it's usually written around June. I would tell you go to um, the, the web, the uh, blog article on a sensor so that, that can really help your child get engaged in the process, the financial consequence of their decisions. Understanding all your options. So, you know, if you know you're going to be a doctor, there's some myths out there on, you know, not taking on debt in more than the first year. Um, if that was the case, we probably wouldn't have any more doctors ever again. So, you have to plan and, and understand how the loan repayment, loan forgiveness options work, um, how we're going to structure that debt. Um, all comes together um, in a big picture. Make sure you understand the short term versus the long term. Again, this is life is full of changes and, and understand that. And again, the federal side offers so many options and it's hard to leave the federal program even though it is a little more expensive because it does help you stay out of default. Default is not an option because the penalties are just too severe and will affect you financially probably for the rest of your life. Um, we're also seeing on the default side a, a trend that's new when you be aware of. I mean, more and more parents are using Parent PLUS loans. Um, we're seeing, and I, the latest numbers I saw were from 2014 or 15, that 156,000 people had their Social Security uh, garnished because of default on a federal loan. So be very, very careful as you go through that. That's not to scare you, but it's just the, the reality of the situation. Again, my name is Fred Amrine. Please visit our site on EFC Plus and, and the people that I apologize. This was a, supposed to be a live event and we had some technical issues today and, and I apologize for that. But please sign up for our, our webinars and, and sign up for our newsletter. Some really great information, hopefully, to help you make better college financial decisions to go through this process and, and that your child reaches the goals that you, you're hoping they'll reach. And, and we're all hoping that they just become productive adults. Again, my name is Fred Amrine. Thanks so, so much for uh, joining us today. And have a great day.